Well, thanks for coming out. Um, I, I've got a lapel microphone, and I, I'm going to be streaming this, I guess, on the website. I didn't know that, so I would have worn more. This would have been more prepared, uh, you know, uh, professionally. Anyway, so glad you could join me. Um, I've got a couple. Of, I'm going to hit a, co a couple of concepts today that I'm, I'm currently working on a book. Uh, it's a it's it's a follow up to the first book that I did. Have, is there anybody here that actually is familiar with the book that I wrote, Modern Flexibilities? So a few people. Um, okay, all of you guys. Cool, cool. Um, that is a. Uh, I like. I'm very proud of it. It's one of the top selling sarcastic lip slur books in South Central <laughs> Ohio, and. Uh, and I mean that actually seriously. It, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a different thing. Um, I like to think about practicing. And, and I spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how to get, uh, get better at it. And that doesn't really help when you think about what uh, uh, get better means. Um, so I'm going to start with a basic question. It's on the, you've guys got a handout. And it's not the uh, chop neutral. It's the other side with the. Uh, yeah, Lipsler World Headquarters. And that's my face, one of my Facebook pages or whatever, Lipsler World Headquarters. So I post, uh, from time to time, I post up exercises there that I'm working on. Um, I'll put a little samples of di different things. So you're welcome to check that out. Uh, I also have a blog that um, called, it's uh, trumpetshed.com. And I've got some articles. And, and over the coming months, I'm going to be having some, uh, posting some uh, materials that are relating to things I'm going to talk about today and some things that are going to be preparatory uh, sort of inside looks at the next, the next book that I'm doing. So you're welcome to get on that. Um, it, there's no, uh, no charge for any of it. Um, I'm the, I've defined the audience for the next or the second book as basically the 22-year-old version of me, or maybe the 25-year-old uh, version of me. In other words, uh, what are you going to do now that you're out of school? Who really loves to practice? Raise your hand high. You love it. You can't wait. OK. All right, so I would put, I'm going to raise my hand, because I really, really love to practice. Part of the conversation is, is, is it's really difficult to to go into something and to really devote yourself to it if you don't really love the process of getting, of improving, right? And I have a couple of theories about why people don't uh, enjoy Because I, when I was 18, uh, when I could get out of bed, uh, I didn't really, I was in a big hurry to get to the to practice room. Um, but the, the number one reason I think that people don't enjoy practicing, well, there's two. It's, it's, it's one and one A. One is that they're in a hurry. And I think when you're in a hurry, it's it's so counterproductive to try to to try to practice in a hurry that um, you get less done than if you took the same amount of time and took your time. So if you feel if you're in college, you, you've, a lot of college students are here. Uh, you probably are given more than you can possibly prepare in a given week between your ensemble stuff and your etudes and your solo work and your uh, technical studies. And if you're like me, you, unless you're not very self-aware, you probably don't leave a lesson going, yeah, man, I nailed that. <laughs> that was great. Uh, I never did. I, for a master's degree, I was here. Uh, I did my doctorate where I'm teaching now at Cincinnati Conservatory. Um, I never walked out of a lesson thinking that I, I nailed it. I never felt really good about that result. Uh, I think one of the reasons was is that there's a kind of a false narrative that you have one week to be able to prepare an etude. And, then you forget about it. But whereas when you learn literature, you're doing it all your life. You, 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 you learn a, a solo or a tune if you're a jazz player. And you don't just, after the jury, throw it away and never play it again. You haven't even started getting good at it yet. And so we have sort of a, sort of a, a disposable way of looking at what we're preparing when we're getting ready for each, each lesson. And then you get through the lesson and you go, OK, I just bought myself another week. And then you don't start practicing until three days before the lesson. And then it's a vicious cycle. It keeps, it keeps re repeating. So I think that the, the, the main thing about that is, is that because you have so much to do, you never really get to any of it. Or it's very difficult to get to any of it. So, and then the other idea is, is that it's difficult to do a process or to take part in a process that um, doesn't have a defined goal for success. And the defined goal for success and when we're in a practice session has to be very clear. 
we have to know what, it, what we want it to, to be, and we also have to know how to measure it, or at least how to think about it, so that we can say after the end of an hour or two hours, I, I just accomplished that, that mission, or I got closer to the goal of what my short and long-term goals. So uh, I always start with this question, and that is, you know, why do we practice? Now, I've, for, for, for the amount of time that we have, I've given you the answer, or at least my answer about it. The number one answer is what? To get better, okay. So, what's that mean? Better at what? Your instrument. Your instrument, okay. Well, my instrument just sits there in a case. No one comes up to me at the end of this concert and goes, oh, I thought your instrument was amazing tonight. <laughs> it touched my heart, right? I don't mean to be glib. Well, I'm, I do mean to be glib, but not to you. <laughs> You know. In any case, no. What are you trying to do? It's very simple, though. Um, but it starts from there. If you haven't got an idea what you're going to do, I got one hour. In the course of one hour, I will have gone from here to here. And uh, job satisfaction in what we do is very low because what we do is invisible and ethereal. It's gone. You play something beautiful in a room. There's nobody else there, and it's gone. And on the other side of it, you can play something very poorly and it's also gone and there's no repercussions. So whereas if you had to take the picture, if you were drawing a picture, there's something to show for it. So, so we don't have the job satisfaction that a construction worker has or someone that's building an architect or somebody that's involved in the process of building a building because they can say, I finished that, but we're never finished. So what's really, really important about what we're doing then is going to be the process of what we're trying to accomplish. We have to be able to, to really look forward to and embrace the, the process. So to get better doesn't mean anything, though that it, it, it sounds good, but it, you can't define it. So anybody else got another? How do you know if you're better after an hour is what I'm saying? How do you know? That's, here's my question. How, how would you know? Small discrete, what are those goals specifically? Okay, that's a reasonable goal. All right, yeah, you can measure that and say, I'm going to sit there and re maybe record it or just judge it and feel like I've got that, you know. And you measure that maybe, maybe by asking yourself a couple questions, you know. Um, was that it? No, yeah. Was that it? No. Yeah. Was that it? Yeah, that was it. Done? I'll get back to this, all right, cool. Um, for the, in the interest of time, uh, the, way that the, the way that I was able to sort of step past that and start to look forward to what I was doing in the practice room was realizing that what I was trying to do was make the music that I'm playing and that I'm going to perform in front of people easier to play. All right? If the, if the music is easier to play, you have control over it. It doesn't have control over you. Most of us go into, when you're younger players, you go into a, a situation and you say, I hope I play well, or I hope I can play this cleanly. Where you want to be, I, where I want to be is, how do I want to play this tonight? How, how do I want to phrase this? How do I want to interpret this? Um, I have that option if I can execute the music in front of me without having to be so busy here that I can think about the, the or, or at least consider the artistic part of it. When you're thinking about the artistic part, the expressive parts, that's when it gets a lot more interesting and a lot more fun to do. But if you're just sitting there going, gosh, I hope I play well, you're not far enough along uh, to, to really gauge what it is, the, the validity of what you're doing. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, actually, someone have an extra copy of my handout? Because I didn't, I didn't wind up with one. Great. All right. So um, I'll give you a couple of demonstrations on this. And uh, you, can, uh, you can follow along. I'm going to be doing this in a way that will be as if I'm practicing it, trying to get better. All right? I'm not trying to demonstrate uh, this for a performance. So what I might do, and um, when I think about specifically making the music easier, I have a couple of goals in mind. And I can tell because of the way it feels to play the line behind the horn. So what I'm talking about is essentially taking the lens of what your focus is and placing it on the part that's sort of here and not out here necessarily. Okay? By the time you hear it, it's too late. All right? So 
if we look at process, anybody ever play, and and it's really really not working. I mean, it feels, it hurts, and you know, there may be blood involved and a possible hernia, and then somebody comes up and they go, "Oh, it was just beautiful." You just you know, at the end of the concert, you ever you know what I'm talking about, and you're and you're thinking, "That sucked. That hurt." Oh, there's got to be a better way to do that, right? And then we just say, well, well we're trumpet players. We're just going to gut it out, and it's going to, you know, we just have to be tough, and I'll eventually get strong enough where I won't notice that. Um, but that doesn't really ever happen, by the way. You might not know, you might forget about it. You just get used to living with it. But if it feels like this when you're playing, it isn't going to be enjoyable for very long. All right. So what I like to do is uh, when I'm, I, I teach pretty much only jazz now, but when I was a classical uh, instructor at the college level, I used to put on videos of uh, Maurice Andre playing Brandenburg and turn off, turn off the sound and uh, move the text so you couldn't tell what he was playing. And, and I would have a student say, what is, what is he playing? And he's just sitting there going, you know, have a little, little whine. He's just doing that, right? And if you try to play Brandenburg, and if you look at what Maurice Andre looks like, inside his body, it's not like he feels like this and it's just hidden, right? He's kind of playing Brandenburg, right? And, and so if, if you're doing something that's not that, don't you want to do that? That's what I want to do, because I didn't do that. I want to, Al Vizzuti and Sergei Nikiriakov and all these guys are doing this stuff over here, and I'm over here trying to play a whole note. And I'm thinking, they're doing something completely different, conceptually and musically. And I want to get some of that. I want to figure out, I want to get inside of what that is, okay? So I'll, I'll start by giving a, a little bit of a demonstration. So after you, when you play something, you give yourself a test, right? It's like giving yourself a test. And the answer is what you play. So your job is to grade it afterwards, all right? So I might play uh, something simple. A little cold. Okay, I'll do it one more time. Aside from the pitch issues, uh, sound okay? Okay, right? It was okay. I mean, it wasn't, you know, no angels came through the clouds or anything like that. Um, did I miss anything? No? Rhythm was okay? We will assume. All right, you didn't see what was written. Um, let's for a second answer yes to all these basic questions. Am I done? Okay, I'm not. Some, some people say no. Okay, why am I not done? I could do that again. I, you know, in fact, I could probably do that 10 times in a row. I can move the penny across the uh, piano bench, write that 10 times and, and not miss anything. All right, so I'm consistent. I can do it 10 times in a row, standing on one leg. So why am I not done? And if I'm not done, what has to happen for me to be done or for me? Because I've, I can play it, right? So there's no reason to play it anymore, right? Or is there? Is it a trick question? Yes. OK. So what I just said to you is I'm going to play here. Good. All right. Um, I'm going to ask myself a couple of things. A real important question about that is, were the notes close together? So in other words, I'm thinking, and now there the notes are close together. Okay, so okay. So what I'm thinking about is when when I'm talking about making the line easier to play, easier to produce. It means that the intervals and the, the range of the line that I'm trying to, I'm going to try to compress it essentially. And that's what, I, that's what Alan Vizzuti does. He's compressed the range of the trumpet uh, conceptually and physically. So for most of us, this will be off camera. Oh, all right, okay, anyway. High C, low F sharp. High F, low F sharp, right? It's like that, okay? Um, from a perspective standpoint, if I'm back here, now high C, low F sharp. Conceptually, if I'm all the way over here, oh, okay, that's this. 
If I go another 10 feet back that way, now all of a sudden the same, the same intervals are closer together in my mind and I want to match that with the physical feeling. <laughs> So I want to feel like, and actually this is kind of cool. Here, maybe not. Anybody want to guess if all of these are all? <laughs> ah, okay, all right, so check this out. You got those two notes. Actually, that's, we'll do them in this order, okay? They're connected. Like that, and I think about over the over the top of the staff, we start to get vertical. It starts to feel like we got G forces. We're lifting off, and there are tiles coming off, and and uh, we start to get lightheaded. Um, but the distance between the G, this octave right here, has to be connected. So so part of what I'm saying when I'm trying to make the line easier is compressing the distance, and then secondly. Getting rid of what I call a, a push in your body, where you're doing that, okay? So if, I gotta, if I'm working with a student, or I'm working with myself, and I'm paying attention to it, either in the mirror, or I'm just trying to, to learn a line, I might see <laughs> right? Um, you'll see somebody move like that. So those notes are really far apart. So if I were working on those, which I don't do anymore, but so I want to think about getting from the F to the A here. I want that. I want to be able to move to there within my body. Okay? So I'm practicing a body set that doesn't move around. This is going to come in handy in a couple of minutes when I show you some stuff that's up in the upper register. All right? So, but this is just basically um, looking at how I'm going to take a line like that and make it closer together. Now the way I do this is, and the way I teach this, and I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you, is I have a student play a C. And then I would say, go down from the C, remember what it feels like here, this is your set, your basic sort of point of reference. And you're going to play the C, and then you're going to go from the C, down to the G, but you're going to go the smallest, smallest distance you can go. And while you go down, you're going to still have that C in mind. I'm still going to be playing the C, but I'm going to kind of drop down and I'll play the G and back up to the C. Does that make sense? Okay, so. And what I'm going to do with that is a repetition that is going to make that, as I do it, what I would say is a refining repetition. So the question when I asked was, do I need to do that again? The answer is, is if I can do a repetitions in a way that refine the line, that make it more smooth, make it easier to play, then yes, I can continue doing repetitions. All right? But the repetitions has to be refining. If you're just repeating something, then you're just, and it's not um, uh, an efficient way of doing it, or an easy way of doing it, then you're just reinforcing the way that you do it, rather than getting better and I hate saying getting better, but making the line easier. So all of my repetitions have to make, have that effect where I'm not feeling this. The repetitions are over and over again, I'm smoothing, I'm sanding a table. Uh, repetitions are a real big part of what we do, but most people will get something, they'll just keep repeating it until they can kind of play it, and then they repeat it some more so that they don't miss it very much, and they stop, all right? So when I think about a repetition and how it refines, if you were to build a table if you're out of wood, um, and you were to say you had the table made, but you were going to go to the sanding phase, right? And you would feel the edges, and it would be rough. The edges are rough. OK, well, what are you going to do? You're going to sand it, right? So take a piece of sandpaper, and then I take the sandpaper, and I do some repetitions like this, wax on, wax off sort of thing from a Karate Kid, all right? So I'm doing the repetition, and then I'm going to take my other hand. I'm going to go, is it smooth yet? No. All right, and I'm going to do some more of that. And I'm going to do the repetitions in a way that I can go, yeah, that's smooth. Now, here's what most people do. It's not smooth yet. It should be smooth by now. I suck. 
like that, right? Well, did you do that if you're, like, your table's not smooth? But that's how you a lot of people practice. Oh, I've been sitting this table for 10 minutes, the same table. It's not even smooth yet. It should be smooth. His table's smooth. He only had to sand for five minutes, right? But the sanding part is, is really, it's the craftsmanship part of what we're doing with our line, a musical line. It can be Tomasi or it can be Donnelly or it can be whatever it is that you're doing. It can be an improvised line. These things are going to have a certain commonality to them when they're, uh, when they're uh, uh, basically executed with ease. And I think that's part of what we're trying to do is to be able to play music with a little bit of ease so we can actually enjoy it and it doesn't hurt and it's not a drag. Um, I'm going to re reiterate what I said at the beginning. You can't do this in a hurry. It just doesn't work. If you're in a hurry, you're not going to get to that point because what we're talking about is calming your mind and being self-aware in a way that is non-judgmental. In other words, you can sit there and go, okay, it just needs to be done again. Uh, there's no emotional baggage with it, right? There's nothing like, oh, you know. Or, I only sand it once, it's done. I'm awesome. You know, that's the other end of it. All right. So, um, yeah, you have control. Do you have control over how to play the passage? And, and when you do that, then you know you're on the right, then you're on the, uh, the right uh, path. Now, the other thing that, that makes it very difficult to practice is, is when I'm saying when you're in a hurry, that can mean a couple of different things. It doesn't mean like, oh, I've only got 10 minutes to practice this piece. What it means is I've got a short period of time. I'm going to just jump in and I'm going to play 16 bars. I'm going to work on that 16 bars when you can't really get through the first two bars or it's going to the part that actually needs it, you know. So, so isolating and working on smaller chunks. Impatience represents itself in a lot of different ways. Going too fast, playing too, too big a chunk, playing with too uh, great, a, trying to do too much with dynamics. So the more that you can take out, you're making things easier, the process easier. If you can't play the notes in a row as quarter notes, it's going to be really tough to play them as 16th notes. All right? And so um, that's where that comes from. So what I call the smallest distance between two notes is one vizuti. All right, a VU. All right, a vizuti unit. I talked to Alan Vizuti about this, but it was over breakfast and he didn't seem too, uh, too impressed. But I'm pretty sure this is what he does from my standpoint. All right. Now, for, for Alan Vizuti, pedal C and double C, that's one vizuti <laughs> for him. All right. But for us, maybe it's a half step or a whole step. Um, how many vizutis is it for you to play an octave? You know, is, is a. Are you trying? Is it feel like that? Is that the octave, or is it? It's it's. There's an easy way to do this, right? You got that. Whatever like that. Now I'm just kind of just messing around with the idea here. Now I'm going to get to uh, a couple of other concepts because this this time is somewhat short. But um, the uh, the other thing that goes with that, and it's going to go with the, the second page, which we're not quite there yet, but is understanding that your your body remains relatively still. So those of you that have my book, um, I, I said I say in there there are a couple of things that you you know you're doing it right when you don't feel pushes in your body. All right. The way I check that is I put my hand on my chest. And if I'm doing it in a way that makes sense and that's, that's efficient, all right. So as I'm Doing that, I'm aware enough behind the horn to know that I'm not doing this in my body. If you're doing that in your body, you're not doing it right. Okay? That's cool. You have to realize that. It's not supposed to feel like that. That's not how Bobby Shue feels inside his body when he's playing or how Hawk and Hardenberger or whoever your hero is. When they're doing it correctly, there's a lot of energy going on. There's good uh, balanced tension, but there's not going to be that. All right. You know what? I guess know what I'm talking about, right? I know it's siesta time, and we're just hitting there. Not everybody's like as gaga about tongue position as I am at three in the afternoon on a Friday. Um, but I find this stuff very interesting because uh, it's what helped me learn to enjoy practicing uh, when I really didn't, really, I really didn't dig it. All right. 
So um, as you go, the other thing that you're going to find, we're talking about making the notes closer together, right? And the, the way that you do and you make things easier is to, um, is to withdraw certain elements from the music that make it, you can deal with just one thing at a time, right? A lot, most of you would probably do that. Take out the articulations. Maybe take out the rhythm. Uh, the first thing I think that you do, that I do, when I'm trying to make something easier, I take out the volume. All right? And, uh, and then we'll get into the, to the, to that aspect in just a minute. But also understanding that a large part of what we're doing when we're playing and when we're practicing a musical line, if it's in the upper register, um, the notes are much closer together in the upper register physically than they are in the lower register, just like a, like a string. So the distance between is one is twice as much as all right so okay you catch what I'm doing there right I'm doing the same idea as what I was doing down below there's a lot of action going on in here but it doesn't feel like this all right um, when I was trying to find out about like playing lead trumpet and asking people, I remember hearing one lead trumpet player say, who was very good, you know when I'm playing that uh, double G, uh, I'm relaxed. All right. I swear, and you'll hear this from people that can play. Do you think there's anything relaxing about a double G? It's like a day at the spa, right? You know? <laughs> there's nothing relaxing about a double G. There's a lot going on on a double G, right? So, so what does that person mean? That's the other thing that goes with all this. You're getting lots of information from everybody. and there's, In fact, you're in the opposite boat than when I was in your age. We had the Trumpet Guild Journal, and that was it. And we could, most of us couldn't afford to join. So, so we'd go to the library or, you know, whatever. Somebody, our teacher would have it. We would borrow one from our teacher and just never return it. Um, but you've got so much information that you can't, you can't even process through, you know, dig through it. Um, so there's the, this stuff has a direct application to what you're doing, and, uh, but you have to interpret what people are talking about. So if I, if I say, when I go, if I play a double G like that, or G or whatever you want to call it, and I say I'm relaxed, what do I mean? You, it's your job to interpret it, right? Am I relaxed? What is it? it People say stuff like this all the time. You gotta support, right? You support your air, right? Yeah, but nobody knows what it means. It's like I, I got jazz majors in my, you know, what's jazz? Uh, well, we're gonna go to improv class. Uh, what's improvisation? It's 30 people. Uh, well, it's sort of like the thing where you, uh, but if you wanna actually do something, don't you think you should define what it is and how to do it and what the terms are, what the information is? So, okay, what's, here, let's just, just talk about that. What's support? Give me, give me a compelling example, because you heard it from seventh grade band camp. You gotta support your ear. Use your diaphragm. That's a great one, right? Okay, yeah. Compression. Compression. Uh, tell that to Joey Tartell. Do you know? Do you guys know Joey? He teaches at IU. Joey says there's no such thing as compression in the lungs because we don't have enough generate enough pressure to actually compress anything. I think he's full of crap. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we've been. We've been arguing about that for like about 10 years. And, uh, I call it, so, but what, if we're going to use that term loosely, what does that mean though? Uh, compress, you compress the air. How and why and why, I mean why? What does compressed air have that uncompressed air doesn't? Or you guys teach, or, uh, you guys teach lessons like to maybe beginners? Anybody do that or work with anybody? How do you teach a breath when you've got a kid? Do you, do you, do you tell, what do you tell them? To, to um, are you talking about compressing the air? Uh, just not even compressing, just, just breathing, uh, blowing the horn. How do you tell them how to do that? Yeah, other than, I mean, assuming that they're not getting it from the first time. I mean, well, how I teach beginners is just like, act like you're blowing out a candle. Blowing out a candle. All right, okay, great. All right, that's a very, a very common one. Anybody heard that one? All right, we hear it all the time. Okay, let's blow out a candle. All right, everybody, one, two, three. <sighs> okay. Let's graph that. Yeah. 
Hang on, wait. Where is it? Oh, I got one that's over there. All right. Let's graph. Let's graph out the uh, the, the uh, blowing out the candle. Let's graph that. There's your blowing out a candle. All right. That's what the that's what the sound in the room was. All right, but we use it all the time. Just just as easy as breathing in and out. It's so easy that you do it in your sleep. But it's not that simple. But you, how many people have used it? I used it until I realized, why can't I play? <laughs> Don't you wonder that? I did. I, that's what drove me crazy. I couldn't play. I was like, this really hurts. This is so anyway. But that's different than. That's a different thing, right? That's not blowing out a candle. But the, I do conce conceive of it as having compression in the, in the way that you would have an aerosol can. <laughs> All right, so if I were going to pretend to be a classical weenie again. I could fit in with other classical weenies, right? They would sound like, oh, sorry, I don't mean that. <laughs> um, no, but. <sighs> now, here's another one. Don't hold your breath, right? You should hold your breath, right? Who's heard that? Don't hold, right, I mean, you should never do that, I mean. Because why? You're going to black, well, you're not going to hold your breath for five minutes, hopefully. <laughs> well, he said black out because you're blacked out. Why shouldn't you hold your breath? Well, I think the common response to that is it causes some kind of adrenaline to create that uh, popping. Right, so the, 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 the fear is that you're going to get something that's going to cause you to grip here. You're going to go, <laughs> and then you're going to blow out two candles and spit on the birthday cake. Right? <laughs> all right? So, but I mean, I'm, I'm serious, but you, but you should be questioning this stuff because you're fed all kinds of things like this that essentially are, are, are questionable at best. Questionable at best, it means you can question them and might just not be appropriate analogies or ways of thinking of, thi thinking of things. They might be the exact opposite of what you need to hear or that helps, the thing that helps you. So, so here's, a, here's a question. If I'm going, There's space in between those notes, right? Am I holding my breath during that time? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I'm not gripping there. All right. Now, there are a lot of great ways of teaching breath and, and conceiving it. And I'm not saying that you should hold your breath. But when I think of it this way, So, that's what Sergei Nikiryakov is doing, by the way, right? Okay, he's just doing a lot better. <laughs> a lot faster and a lot cooler and a lot more all over the horn. But I want to know what he's doing. Don't you guys want to know what he's doing? Because he's doing something different, you know? And so, there's a, there's a, there's a, I'm on a treasure hunt for cool stuff uh, in what I do that, that, that makes making music easier. And there's an idea, and it's a great idea. It's, it has to do with compound interest. If you just get every day, get a little bit better, you know, like you're saving for retirement, put away 10 bucks a day or a month or, what, or a week or whatever, and by the time you're 65, you'll have a million two, which will be worth $6,300 common at this rate. No, but, but, you know, that stuff works, right? You get a little, the little bit better version of yourself each day, and you're going to get really good. And, but this guy's a millionaire at the age of 23. A multimillionaire. That's that's what Sergei Nikiryakov had a, a ten million dollars in the bank of all that equity, and he figured some stuff out. 
Um, why can uh, Sergei Nikirikov play uh, Sanson's Capriccio and Rondo? I'll give you a, cl a clue. It's because he tries to play Capriccio and Rondo instead of Stamp. <laughs> I'm not saying he doesn't do Stamp, but he's not spending 45 minutes a day playing footballs. He's playing, uh, he's playing a cello concerto or a, a violin. Um, it's not a concerto. What would you call that? It's a Capriccio and Rondo. It's, it's a form. Um, <laughs> but he, from the music, he's figuring out how to play that music, right? He takes his trumpet and he plays the violin part, all right? And then he uses the music to instruct the trumpet playing. We generally do it backwards. We sit down and go, okay, I'm going to play my long tones. Now I'm going to play my, my scales and then I'm going to do this. All right, now I'm ready to play the music, right? It's like, and these are necessary things to do, but they're, it's sort of like thinking you're like Frankenstein. You, you have all these parts and they're somehow going to magically come together. If you're not trying to play Capriccio and Rondo or Carnival Venice, you're never going to be able to play those pieces, right? And the skills that are required to play those pieces are, are different than what most of us are practicing. Uh, or at least they're extended past what most of us are doing in a practice room. So um, the expectation of what's going to happen in a practice session for these people is a very different thing. And I would encourage you to check that out. All right. So um, what, is, what are the two big considerations that, that most people have when they're playing an, a brass instrument? They come up to me or the, hey, I really want to work on my range and endurance endurance okay all right so let's say you want to do that that's where I'm gonna get into this next concept that's on the second page don't turn it over yet um, oh, dude <laughs> now you have to leave the room until we're ready to we get to that part all right okay um, so how many people think that playing soft is difficult softly is difficult anybody all right who struggles with it I did for years right yeah Okay, I would submit this, that if, uh, if you find playing soft difficult, you're probably not doing it right. All right, fair to say, <laughs> not a big reach. Uh, but that might be everything. You may be doing everything wrong if you can't figure out how to play soft, right? I would start from there. You guys have a Clark book? All right, okay. Um, consider the source. Of our, inform of our information, okay? So um, I will, I'll give you a couple of these nuts and bolts and then I'll fill them in. If you wanna, if you wanna um, in increase your endurance, um, play softer. Okay, that's pretty easy, yeah. <laughs> that's like nine times out of 10 for what people, in terms of your practice, in your practice re re regimen. So all, a lot of these repetitions that you're going to be doing when you're working on Tomasi or if you're working on you know, your excerpt or whatever like that, I would submit, I would say that it's my contention that the number one thing that causes you to get tired is volume. Okay? See if, if you don't agree next time you're in the practice room. All right? Now, if you, uh, if you follow that line, um, some, might, some might say, well, you've got to play soft correctly. Right? I mean, you got to. Again, what does that mean? Does it come out? Is it soft? We're we're on our way there. Okay. All right. So I'm not, I'm probably likely not going to damage my chops playing soft in the middle staff and a, and a lower staff. So I can kind of establish a baseline. All right. So my premise is is there's an easy way to do it, or at least for today, an easier way to do it, and it being the musical line that you're going to be playing. If you can't make it one thing easy, you're not going to make the stuff you're working on easy. All right, does that make sense? Easy enough, right? So, um, right before I get into this, what I'm talking about, again, overarching, is studying your own playing, the mechanism that you have to play music, what the results are, what it feels like, what it looks like. Uh, I used to be, 23 years ago, I was in a band here. And I, I, I said, stood around, I'm getting stuttery, just jittery thinking about it, nervous, um, next to a guy that went out and played lead on Maynard's band for about three or four years. And, um, and I, I just, every day I just went, what is that? Uh, Scott Engelbright was one of the big lead players that was here in, in the one o'clock. And uh, next to him, so I was, I was over there, and next to him was Scott Harrell, who never played anything above a piano. 
and was a monster jazz player, and he never missed. So these guys are just sh shredding, and he's over here like this, and I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I was just, again, waiting to get discovered as the uh, fraud in the band. Fortunately, I never got discovered. I got out before that happened. Um, but I keep waiting. I check my mailbox waiting for a notice that uh, retroactively my 1 o'clock card has been uh, uh, deactivated. So um, in any case, I have a concept that is based on a way of practicing and setting up a way of practicing in your practice room that I call chop neutral. Okay, And the idea behind it is to play in such a way that um, you can basically do this all day. All right. If you can ask while you're doing it, you can say, could I do this all day? And it all comes back to Clark to number 37. All right. Who's Herbert L. Clark? Who was he? Or is he still alive? I kind of gave it away. Okay, he's dead. All right. <laughs> who, who was he? Who was Herbert L. Clark? Famous cornet virtuoso. Famous cornet virtuoso. So famous that nobody else in here knows. Famous who knows who he was? Okay, all right. Well, I would hope that. It's the NTC, right? Uh, pretty good player, right? Um, played in whose band? Sousa. Sousa's band. And he was a section player, right? No. No, no he was the cornet soloist. Co the cornet soloist. Uh, that's easy stuff, right? Not, right? So uh, you guys played that stuff before? Yeah. All right. Do you know the, the Frank Simon interview that he did when he sat down to got the job in the Sousa band next to Clark. He's an interview that he said, the best lesson I ever had. Frank si Simon from Cincinnati, by the way, um, got into the Sousa band and trashed his chops, I think, within a couple of days. He couldn't play any longer. All right. Now, Frank Simon took over for Herbert L. Clark eventually. All right. And Frank Simon is considered the next great virtuoso. Right. So he gets into the Sousa band. He goes up to, he said, I made an appointment with uh, Mr. Clark. I went up to his hotel room. And uh, I said, I got to quit. I got to quit the band. I can't play. I've got bruised lips and the swelling. I can't, I can't play. I hate to disappoint you, whatever. So Clark says, look, here's the deal. Just come, sit down, put your horn up, pretend to play until the, the bruises subsist or subside and uh, the swelling goes down. Don't look up at the old man. And, uh, and then, we'll, then we'll go from there, right? OK? So he did that. He went, sat back down in the section, pretended to play for a couple days. You know, Susan was like, you know what's going on? And Clark's like, Leave me. Yeah, everything's cool. Then he says, come to my, my hotel room. I'll teach you how to practice. And then he showed him the book that you all have, or basically those exercises. Have you read the text of the Clark book? You guys have a Clark book? You've read it? Is it in the German, French? So you have it. Actually, you've read the updated publishers from 1988 or whenever they did that. The actual real text is different than what's in your Clark book. You have to go back to the one, the 1911 version. I will say this, and this is one thing. This is, this is my book, and I, here's how it starts, my book. It's a quote. It says, having given thousands of lessons to all kinds of students, out of that number, there has not been one who have ever read the text of any method. <laughs> that's Herbert L. Clark in his 1943 letter to Donald Reinhardt. And that's his emphasis, one in all caps underlined. That was in his letter, OK? All right. So basically, I would tell you, if you read what, and I don't have it in front of me. I, I did a transcription of it, but I didn't, I didn't bring it. If you read what Clark says, he says, this is what I do that I can overcome any difficulties encountered in a musical passage. And at the end of the two-hour concert, play the highest notes with ease and without effort. I would take him at his word. <laughs> All right? Don't you want to know about that? Don't you want that? I, I want to do that. I'd, li I'd like to have that. All right? Um, I don't want to feel like that. All right? So he says, by following the instruction for this book, if these exercises are practiced according to instruction, in one breath, uh, you can do the same thing. All right. So I want to take that one further, farther, further, 
Where's Tartel? I landed. Died. Um, further. Anyway, um, that if you could figure out how to play Clark II, you know, in the way that I'm talking about, in the way that he's talking about, you can apply that way of playing to a large majority of the type of practice that you need to do on a daily basis to learn material and make it easy. All right. So instead of going scales, Clark, tonguing, da da da. I want to set up chop, what I'm calling chop neutral, and then I'm going to play everything from there. Okay? This is how I'm going to play today, how I'm going to play the music that I'm going to work on. And I'm going to try to relate to the musical lines that I'm working on, I'm going to try to relate those to this feeling, this concept. All right? Uh, have anybody scuba dive? Oh, come on, really? All right. So I figured there'd be a bunch of people that. There's a concept in, in scuba diving. You have a, a, boy, a BCD, a vest, that's called the buoyancy compensating device. or It's a thing. It's a, you, you got a button and a hose that goes from your scuba tank into the vest. And it's a life jacket. And you add air to it and you float. So you, can, you, know, you, can, you don't have to swim. You can just sit there. And then when you want to descend, you have weights on your, on your uh, belt, the weight belt. And you release air from the buoyancy compensating device, right? And you sink, all right? So you, you can keep releasing air until you get to the depth or approximate depth that you want to hang out. Now, you'll have a limited amount of air when you're scuba diving, all right? So um, the more effort that you're expending in the act of scuba diving, the less time you have to stay down. All right. So the, when you're learning to scuba dive, they, they practice a thing called neutral buoyancy. So you, you might be in 30 feet of water, you go down to the bo bottom of the ocean, you're down there 30 feet. And what you do with your little buoyancy compensating device is you release air and you lean forward. All right. And you lean forward until you're about 45 degrees like this. So you're neither f raising or sinking. All right. And you're basically doing this. All right. And then you're like this and then you just kick your legs up and you swim. And it's the closest thing you can do to like flying. It's really cool. All right. And what that means is, is that you're not expending any and, and uh, you're not fighting the urge to, you know, like you try to swim to the bottom of a pool, you know, it's like really difficult because you're trying to float. You've got a, a lung full of air. So you're not fighting to, to, to descend uh, the, or fighting to come up depending on where you're going in your dive. All right. So you're constantly tweaking this to stay neutral. Okay. So easy enough. So what I'm going to say here is with this idea, this is what I'm thinking about when I'm playing Clark II. Now, I can play that. I don't have to think about it, right? That's why we do the same stuff or similar stuff every day, so I don't have to think about the idea of what are the notes. Now, if I'm looking at those notes, I'm going to be operating at about 60% of what we need concentration-wise to make this work. Okay? Your eyes short out everything. They take over. Your optic nerve just <laughs> And you'll just stare at that music even though you've played it every day. So what I want to do is operate is I'm playing something by ear and I'm playing it by feel. And when I say feel, where is everything? And I've got a little list of questions that I can ask myself right there. Can I play this all day? Can I play a little softer? This is, you can turn it over now to your blue book. In each case, when I do those repetitions or while I'm practicing, I'm trying to become aware of what's happening here. I'm not necessarily saying, oh, keep your tongue down or do, you know, put your jaw out. I'm not, I'm not giving myself technical instructions. I'm just sort of doing like a guided meditation on, on the, play of the playing of what I'm doing, but I have to do it myself, all right? So as I do that, I can say to myself, all right, um, what would happen if, who uses this feel like they sometimes use too much pressure, mouthpiece pressure, huh, right? Okay. If you don't want to do that, you actually have to practice not, right? I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out there too, <laughs> a new concept. Um, but how do you do that? I can start with this. As I'm doing that, I'm thinking, I'm trying to get a feel on my top lip, and I want to let see, see what would happen 
if I unpin, I think of it this way, unpin the lip from the teeth, let it just come a little bit away, and I'll just remove a little bit, just like a, a, a tiny fraction of the, of the pressure and see what happens. Maybe, it, maybe the sound stops, but I'm, that's not going to stop me from doing it, right? So this is a fishing expedition on what it's going to feel like to make things easier, what it's going to, what it's going to look like to be searching for a better way of doing it. It's going to be real messy. And what happens is, is if, if you're real super, your chops are super tight, you get this. You guys get that one, right? Well, I said it's because chops are tight, but why else would that happen? There's no vibration happening, right? Okay, so that's, there's no sound. So why does that, why does that thing happen? What are your options? Possible things that could go wrong. Survey says family feud. Come on. <laughs> the air's what? Not I'm not supporting my air. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm going to just say on the middle of the staff, or you know, first line F sharp. I might not need a whole lot of support on that, but we could. That's part there. You know, that could be one of them. It's got to be. Is it an air problem? That's one of my favorite ones. There's no chop problems, only air problems. That's not true either. <laughs> right? There's no linkage problems, only carburetor problems, right? <laughs> you know? So in any case, um, if, if something happens like that, I would, I would say you probably would want to think about why that happens <laughs> so that you can correct it. Because you're, otherwise you're a victim of, of your circumstance and you don't have a plan. If you're on the golf course and you slice the ball and you know what causes that, what your habits are to make that happen, ideally you can correct it. It doesn't mean you'll never do it, but you can at least deal with it on the gig in the practice session. These are things, this is part of that process is learning how you play and learning how, guiding yourself through this process of making it easier, okay? All right, so what would happen if I increase the pressure of the support? In other words, if I, if I firm this up, does it get a little easier? Yeah, actually, it did get a little bit easier there. All right, um, these things I can add and subtract. I can. I'm tinkering. I'm trying to find a. It's like a pendulum. It's a balance point. If if you're over here and you know, chops are all tight and you know I was really struggling, and maybe you actually have to relax your your lips. Maybe what would happen if I relax? Whatever that means. Okay, well, pfft, nothing. All right. Well, what if I find a balance point? <laughs> The balance point. And, and so when I warm up, I'm not trying to, you know, warm up like jumping jacks and, and make myself, you know, prepared. I'm trying to remember what it feels like to play easily from the last time I played music easily. Does that make sense? It's, it's more about remembering how to play as opposed to learning how to play. All right. And uh, that's a lot easier to do it that way. All right. I can, I can talk about, I can feel the tongue position. You guys know what I'm talking about. Like, just be aware of it. Where's your... Oh, my tongue is real high or really low. You're going to get different. You're going to get different um, uh, feedback from your teachers. Some t some teachers are going to tell you when you're playing a flow study or a Clark study, your tongue should be at the bottom of the, of your mouth. Why is that? Nobody's ever t heard that. Or should have, oh, you should have a real open. Anybody heard that? Only one person. Come on. Your teacher's probably sitting next to you. You don't want to get, yeah, all right, okay. You think he's going to make fun of my teacher. And you're right. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, where your tongue is doesn't really matter if, if it works. Uh, I tongue between my teeth when I articulate. You're not supposed to do that. I do that. Works for me. Uh, I'm not telling you you shouldn't have your tongue down low, but do you know where it is? Where were you when your tongue was out? Okay, all right, okay. Um, all right, so in any case, here's the idea, and here's the concept. So we so, sort of set up this way of playing, and while I'm doing the repetition, so it's refining repetitions, I'm thinking, here's, that's, that's feeling pretty good, right? Now, as I do the repetitions, here's my, sort of my gas gauge. And it's going to 
as I get a little bit fatigued, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, I'll feel a little fatigue, right? A little bit, not, not a bad fatigue, just done a few, few. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop and I'm going to wait before I play the next thing. Ah, I'm ready to go. All right. I practice for long periods of time um, because I can, but uh, most people generally they do a the curve for the breath is the curve for the practice session. So one thing I like to tell my students is if, if most people went to the gym like they go to the practice room, you would have to leave the gym via ambulance or hearse. Okay. So most, most people practice, especially students or people that really don't have an idea of pacing, will go until they can't play anymore at the end of their practice session. Well, guess what happens at two hours later when you pick your horn back up? You still can't play again. Or you still have residual lactic acid or whatever it is that's built up in your, in your chops that made you tired in the first place. The idea is quit while you're ahead. That's why shorter, either shorter periods of practice or practicing in such a way that you don't, there's a, there's a certain point in your practice, right, where <coughs> It, fall, it falls out, you're not getting back, right? The minute you, you have to become a student of your playing so you don't go past that point. Does that make sense, right? Once, you're, once you do that, you're, you're done. So we're talking about preserving the way that you play and being thoughtful and mindful of your chops, of what's going on. So let's just pretend that I've established chop neutral and I can do it. It feels pretty good. Now. Um, can I do it all day? Yeah. Does it sound good? All right. Yeah. Now I'm going to go to an interval study and I'm going to apply that way, that way of playing to the interval study. Okay. Now I'm doing the same thing. I'm playing force moving by whole steps and inversions. All right. Woody Shaw. It's a Woody Shaw lick, all right? Um, I don't have to think about it because I know it. And while I'm doing that, I'm feeling my chops. And I'm saying, can I do this all day? Is am I still in chop neutral? All right. What if I tongue it? OK. Now, I can practice like that as long as I need to. I can go down a step. You know, I can do whatever I need to do to make that happen with my repetitions. And as I do it, say if I'm going up an octave, I'm not going to do it on that there, but if I'm going up an octave, sorry, What I'm doing while I do that is I'm going, okay, what's happening here? And can I get those notes closer together? Making sense? Sorry. Okay, so now I'm on a high D flat. Can I do that all day? I can't do that all day, but as I'm talking to you right now, I can feel I'm coming back to chop neutral before I start my next round. No one's going to tell me about that. I have to be, I have to be paying attention so that I can, uh, my resources are, you know, basically my strength. I have to steward my resources. I got to do this in such a way for you that when I'm done, I can still go over and do a sound check with the band and then play at 8, 8.30, right? So, and I practiced for maybe two hours this morning. Um, and I didn't spend a whole bunch of chop. And when I, when I did, I took enough rest that I'm, you know, I'm in good shape. So, so you've got three, three basic, well, obviously a bunch of basic concepts. But the first idea is the chop neutral. Um, establishing a way of playing and then going to the next thing and still play that way, right? Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm just uh, that played down the octave. As I'm doing those repetitions, I'm trying to get them closer together. Now, don't do that on your lead mouthpiece. I guess I should, you to, and don't do it on your jazz horn. All right. <sighs> Compressing. <sighs> All right. I can do that for long periods of time. I have just increased your knowledge of, of ways to approach endurance and upper register and making a musical line easier. When the musical line is easier, you're going to have a lot more fun and you're going to have a better idea of if your practice session is accomplishing its goals, even if it's just a small part of something that's easy. If you don't warm up and get something, anything easy, nothing will be easy. You, you understand that. So we have to get things easy from the get-go, all right? Um, I have to go here, I guess. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any? I, I don't have a lot of time for... When you're playing um, some lead stuff, I saw that right after you finished, you exhaled your air. Yeah, I, I'm doing that for demonstration purposes. Okay. I don't normally do it uh, that way. But that's what's going on in my body, what I feel and how I conceive of it. Not everybody does that, by the way, of course. But I, so your job is to say, okay, well, he was saying this and, you know, and then can you, can you try it and make it that you can feel it that way, what happens, all right, and interpret it what it feels like for you. So you're going to get it in three, all these concepts come in three phases. The first is intellectual. Everything I talked about, you probably got intellectually no problem there's nothing that's rocket surgery right okay the second part is being able to feel in your body and hear the re in the practice room okay what does that feel like when that happens it's the best thing in the world right oh this is what my teacher was talking about and you're in the practice room and you go this is amazing then that's the end of it for most of us then we try it with I finally learned how to triple tongue and then two weeks later you can't triple tongue with crap but in that practice room that day, you thought you'd mastered it, right? Anybody had this experience? Like, I got this. I totally got this. And then the next day, you ain't got this. Because you're missing phase three, and that's to memorize what you're doing. You've got to look at it in the mirror, study your face, what's it feel like, take notes, memorize the feeling and memorize the sound, memorize the look. Take a, a, this, a video. Video what's going on. The first time you're playing a high G with, with, with ease, get it on video or whatever, and then come back to it, because you're trying to remember that. You don't want to have to relearn how to do this over and over again. That's another thing that's very frustrating about what we do. We end up relearning the same things instead of really learning something and then keeping it with us, all right? I got to go, so I would like to say thanks to you guys for being a, an attentive audience.